Welcome to Aviano Baptist Church. Thanks for braving the rain. Um, but if you haven't braved the rain by now, you're probably dead because it's raining every day. And you probably, if you haven't left your house in like a month, I don't know how you're surviving. Anyway, uh, thank you for being here with us. Please rise and worship with us. Call us out from the depths into your freedom. Our chains are gone. No weapon form shall prevail. Your word is stronger. We overcome. Your glory resounds through the age, all saints declaring your great renown. No kingdom forever will stand, you won't be shaken, we will not fear. Our God, a mighty warrior, you're a consuming fire. In victory you reign, we triumph in your name. Jesus, the great commander, you conquer death forever. In victory you reign, we triumph in your name. Your glory resounds through the age, all saints declaring your great renown. Your kingdom forever will stand, we won't be shaken, we will not fear. Our God, a mighty warrior, you're a consuming fire. In victory you reign, we triumph in your name. Jesus, the great commander, you're a good death forever. In victory you reign, we triumph in your name. And we declare your name is power, exalted one, your name is you stand alone, a strong defender. Above you there's no other, above you there's no other. And we declare your name is power, exalted one. Your name is higher. You stand alone, a strong defender. Above you there's no other, above you there's no other, above you there's no other, above you there's no other. Our God, a mighty warrior, you're a consuming fire. Victory you reign, we triumph in your name. Jesus, the great commander, you conquer death forever. In victory you reign, we triumph in your name. Our God, a mighty warrior, you consuming fire. In victory you reign, we triumph in your name. Jesus, the great commander, you conquer death forever. In victory you reign, we triumph in your name. You may be seated. Amen. Join me in a word of prayer this morning. Father, what some amazing truths that we can sing about you, that you reign victorious, that you conquered the grave forever, never to die again. 
And Father, because of that, you can give us life. And Lord, in just a few minutes in the service, we're going to open up your word and we're going to just rejoice and worship in your resurrection, what you have done in our lives, what you've revealed about yourself, and how that can transform us. And Father, thank you for that truth. And thank you for the incredible privilege of being able to gather here, that we can open up your word, that we can worship freely, that we can come together in this place. And Father, we just pray that everything that we do, that we would just have an attitude and a heart and a spirit to, to worship you, to recognize you for who you are and to respond as your spirit speaks to our hearts today. Lord, we want to continue always to lift up the deployed families to you and, and pray you would just keep your hand on them. Those in our congregation that, that are dealing with health issues, particularly when we lift up Cece Raphimo, she's recovering from some health issues. And Father, with so many others, there are sicknesses and other issues. Lord, we just pray for them that your healing hand would be on them. And Father, that you would just bless our time together. Upstairs in the children's ministry, here in this room, time of singing, giving, in your word, that everything would just bring glory and praise to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome to Aviano Baptist Church. My name is Barry Cole. I'm the pastor here. We're absolutely glad, as Matt said, that you braved the weather to come on out and worship with us this morning. Um, if you are a first-time guest with us this morning, a very special welcome to you if this is your first time here with us. I do hope you got a welcome envelope when you came in. Uh, what we want you to know and we hope you'll discover about Aviano Baptist Church is that this is a place that we want to help you connect with Christ so you can experience Him in a real, in a, in a, in a, in a, a fantastic, powerful way in your life. You can come to grow in your relationship with Him so that He can send you out into this world. And so I hope as you came in, you got one of these welcome envelopes, uh, different information about ministries that we have, um, that there are opportunities for you to do that, so flip through it. If you have questions about anything, there should be some contact information on the bottom of each of those flyers. And the other thing I'll ask you to do if this is your first time with us this morning is there's this third little flap in the bulletin that just says, tell us about yourself. So if you wouldn't mind just taking a moment, help us get to know you a little bit better. Um, it's perforated, so tear it off, throw it in the offering plate as it goes by a little bit later in the service. And then on the back of that, and this is for everybody, on the back of that it says prayer requests. And so if there is any specific way that we could be praying for you, we can minister to your family, you just jot that down on there, put some contact information on the front so we can follow up with you, we know who we're praying for. Um, and then you too, just tear that off and throw it in the offering plate uh, when it goes by a little bit later in the service. We have a prayer team that prays over these, our deacons pray over, I pray over them, so let us know how we can be ministering to you and how we can pray for you. Okay, so let me ask you to turn to the back center section of the bulletin where the announcements are. Let me just draw your attention to a couple of things. You notice last week it was very full, this week not so much. Um, this is a holiday week, Thanksgiving, so note at the bottom, first of all, note some things that are not happening this week. You'll notice down at the bottom there's a lot less stuff where it says this week. The ladies' Bible studies are taking a break because of Thanksgiving. Um, some, the home groups... Yeah, all of the home groups are taking a break this week because of Thanksgiving, so just kind of be, be aware of what is not happening because of the holiday this week. But let me draw your attention to some things. The Wyvern Wonderland Base Outreach, that's going to be on the 6th of December. We're still praying that we're going to get a yes, and I'm supposed to get a, a decision from the legal office early this week, so I should know tomorrow or Tuesday maybe um, to get the final thumbs up that we can do that. Continue to pray for that. This is an incredible opportunity that God will open a door, I think, just even through this and, and through this outreach, but then also sort of opens the door for us to have future outreaches on base. So you be in prayer about that, but mark your calendar for that, because we're going to be asking, as soon as we get the two thumbs up, we're going to be asking for some help. Now, people to serve in, in hour-long shifts out there at the, at the Wyvern Wonderland event, and then also we're going to need some donations for things to put on the table there. So we're going we're gonna to post all that on the Facebook page this week as soon as we have an answer. Um, send it out in the church WhatsApp group, so I hope you're connected to one of those. Um, so just kind of keep an eye um, as, we, as we have more information to pass out about that. Christmas Eve services, if you didn't grab one of these last week, um, grab one this week. It's an invitation to our Christmas Eve services, first of all for you, to join us on Christmas Eve at 3 o'clock. 4.15, 5.30, we'll have three services on Christmas Eve, so pick one. They're all going to be exactly the same. We'll end our time with a candlelight singing of Silent Night. It's a beautiful time to come together and celebrate our Lord's birth. And so this is an invitation for you, first of all, to join us on Christmas Eve. But then take these. There's a whole stack of them out there, and if we run out, we'll make more. So take them, share them with your friends, share them with your neighbors, coworkers that, that don't attend church anywhere, don't have anywhere to worship on Christmas Eve. Take these and share them. Um, invite them to join us uh, for a Christmas Eve service on the 24th, obviously. Uh, oh, we're also looking for some families to read some scriptures during those services. We'll have an Old Testament and a New Testament reading in all three services, same reading in all three services, but I want some families to be involved to do that. 
So if you are interested in doing that, come talk to me and to let me know. I'll tell you what the, scripture refer- the scriptures are, and you can tell me which one you want to do. Um, but come talk to me if you're interested in doing that, and we'll get you on the schedule, um, get some families involved doing the scripture reading during that service. We're still praying about uh, God opening the door for us to start a Sicily area home group. So if you're interested in that, being a part of it, hosting it, or leading it, come let me know um, so we can have that. There's a lot of people that live in that area. We, we want to begin a home group in that area so that we can reach folks. So it's, it's, you know, drive all the way up here to the church or drive to one of the other home groups and would be one in your neighborhood. So if you're interested in that, come let me know. Um, and then just one final note about the Moldova clothing drive. This is the last week the collection boxes will be out there. Um, it has been incredible. We have sent, I think, 700 pounds of clothes already, and that doesn't include what's in the box um, out there now, which is, or, which is currently full. So it's going to be somewhere over 1,000 pounds of clothes are going there to Moldova, which has been an incredible blessing. So if you brought some already, thank you. Uh, God has really has used that and will continue to use that. But if you got some stuff to bring, just know this will be the last week the collection boxes will be out there, um, and then we'll, we'll may have another one in the future, but this will be the last week for this one this time. Okay, those are all the announcements, and so grab a copy of the bulletin. If you didn't get one coming in, get one going out so you can keep track of all the things that are going on this week. We are absolutely thrilled that you're here this morning, and as we continue just in our time of worship, let's just take a moment, stand, greet one another in the name of the Lord. you hurting and broken within overwhelmed by the weight of your sin Jesus is calling have you come to the end of yourself do you thirst for a drink from the well Jesus is calling oh come to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was born with the precious blood of jesus christ and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes the new life is born Jesus is calling oh come to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with 
the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior! Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah! Christ is risen. Bow down before him. For That covers me and raises this dead man's life. It's all because of Jesus. I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive. Giver of every breath I breathe, author of all eternity. Giver of every perfect thing, for you be the glory. <laughs> Maker of heaven and of earth, no one can comprehend your worth. King over all the universe, for you be the glory. I'm alive because I'm alive in you. It's all because of Jesus I'm alive. It's all because the blood of Jesus Christ that covers me and raises this dead man's life. It's all because of Jesus. Every sunrise sings your praise. The universe cries out your praise. 
singing freedom all my days now that I'm alive. It's all because of Jesus I'm alive. It's all because the blood of Jesus Christ that covers me and raises this dead man's life. It's all because of Jesus. It's all because of Jesus I'm alive. It's all because the blood of Jesus Christ that covers me and raises dead man's life. It's all because of Jesus, I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive. Ushers, please come forward and receive the offering. You may be seated. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. By God's word, at last my sin I learned. Then I trembled at the law I'd spurned Till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary There your mercy and your grace was free There your pardon multiplied to me there my burden so found liberty at Calvary. Now I've given Jesus everything. Now I gladly know him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. There your mercy and your grace was free. There your pardon multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty at Calvary. At Calvary. Please stand and sing with us. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Yeah. There your mercy and your grace was free. There your pardon multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty at Calvary. There your mercy and your grace was free. There your pardon multiplied to me. There my burden so found liberty at Calvary. There my burden so found liberty at Calvary. You may be seated.
seated. Amen. Thank you, as always, praise team. Such a wonderful job week after week. Well, as we said earlier, we're glad you are here this morning. The weather, sometimes we look outside and be tempted to say, you know what, it's kind of a cruddy day today. I think I'm just going to turn over and hit that snooze button again and go back to sleep. And, and, and let me just say this, we are the ones who braved the weather this morning and came here, but, but remind folks, there are a lot of things in our church that don't work. You go downstairs and the electric in half of the fellowship hall doesn't work and the heat's a little bit iffy downstairs. There are some things in our church that, do, that don't work, but the roof works. So it might be rain, it might be wet and raining really hard outside, but it is dry in here. So you know somebody who should be filling the seat next to you that's not here today because it's raining hard? Just remind him of that. The roof in our church. If nothing else, the roof does in fact work. Well, this morning we are finishing up our Possibility Sermon Series. And we have been, over the last three months, we've been taking this journey and we've been looking at many of the miracles of Jesus. And, and all along we've been asking ourselves this question. This is the question I've been challenging us and challenging myself to ask as we look at all of those miracles for us to look past the surface, look past just what is happening in the moment, and ask ourselves this question with this Jesus in my life, with this God at work in me and this God at work around me, what is in the realm of the possible? What are the possibilities that it opens up? And maybe, as we mentioned, maybe the opposite question, is there anything impossible with this God in my life? And that's the question we've been asking as we've been going through these. And this morning, we're going to look at it, a miracle, at least the way, the way Paul describes it, as he writes about this miracle, would have been called the granddaddy of all of them, and that is the resurrection of Jesus. Now, I know that this is not Easter, and we will, we will spend some time, we'll come back to this in Easter, and we, and we have to talk about this at Easter time, because that's what we celebrate there. Today's not Easter. But we can't spend all this time looking at the miracles. We can't look at the miracles that, that were performed by Jesus, and the miracles that were performed during His earthly ministry. We can't look at the miracles and not look at this one the biggest of all of them. We can't just ignore it, pretend it doesn't exist during this time, looking at the miracles. And so if you've got a Bible with you, and I hope you do, I take it out and turn with me to the 24th chapter of Luke's Gospel. I mentioned a little Bible trivia several weeks ago that there are two miracles recorded in all four Gospels. The feeding of the 5,000 is one of them, and the resurrection of Jesus is the other. It's so significant that all four Gospel writers... The Holy Spirit inspired all four gospel writers to write something about it. We're going to look at Luke's account this morning. It's Luke chapter 24. If you don't have a Bible with you, check the rack under the seat in front of you. You'll find one right there. You can take it out and use it if you need to use it today. If you don't have a Bible at home or you, yours has been lost in the household goods move somewhere, feel free to take that with you and use it. That's what they're there for. Um, also, if you are joining us via U version, go ahead and log into that. You'll find our event there, our church service is an event there. You'll find today's uh, scripture reference, Luke 24, verses 1 through 11, already be set out um, and set aside there. Of the re resurrection of Jesus, this is what Paul said, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul talks about the resurrection of Christ. And he, in a nutshell, he says, listen, all of Christianity stands or falls on this one event. This is the foundation. In fact, he said, listen, if this thing didn't happen, if Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, then our preaching is in vain, our belief, our faith is in vain. There's no reason to talk about this Jesus fella. There's no reason to think about this Jesus fella. There's no reason for us to come to church week after week and open up the Word of God. There's no reason for us to even give a second thought about this Jesus guy if the resurrection didn't happen. It means his death on the cross was just another unfortunate soul that was the victim of Roman cruelty. He was no different than any other, any other religious-sounding teacher that walked the face of this earth. There was no difference in him if the resurrection didn't happen. In fact, Paul went so far as to say that if Christ wasn't raised from the dead, then those of us who believe should be about more than anyone else in this world pitied among all men. Pitied. Because Jesus said He was God in the flesh, said He had come from God, He was going to return to God. And if that's not true, then we've fallen, for the, we've fallen for the biggest con man that's ever lived. we followed after the biggest lie that's ever been perpetrated on mankind if the resurrection didn't happen. That's how significant Paul describes it. Pretty big words, right? Pretty big claim. It's a pretty big event. So let's read Luke's account of it, Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 11. I'll pop it up here on the screen if you want to follow along up there. 
But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone, stone rolled away from the tomb. And when they entered, they didn't find the body of Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothes. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the, meds, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again? And they remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and all the rest. Now they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, also the other women who were with them, telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared as nonsense to them, and they would not believe them. And here's our big idea this morning, that the resurrection is not only the foundation of our faith. That's the way Paul describes it. We just talked a little bit about that, the way he talks about it in 1 Corinthians 15. This is the fundamental issue for why we believe in Christ. The resurrection is not only the foundation of our faith, but it should radically alter how we live our lives as believers. It's not just that one event that gives us reason to believe in Christ, but it's for every single moment of every day after that. Once we put our faith and trust in Christ for every moment, for all the rest of eternity, it should radically alter how we follow Him, how we live our lives as believers. Now, on Easter, we're going to take a look at this again, and we're going to look at the theological implications of it. What does it mean from a, that He has life so He can give us life? We'll look at the theological implications of the resurrection on Easter. But this morning, sort of in keeping with this sermon series, as we wrap this up, looking at this miracles, these miracles, asking this question about with this God in our life, what is in the realm of the possible, I want us to consider the resurrection in terms of what it reveals to us about Jesus and what it reveals to us about His work in our lives. And I want us to look at three specific things about that. First of all is this, that His work exceeds our expectations, always exceeds our expectations. Expectations are important. You know, the, the single greatest cause of, of discord, disagreement in any relationship are unmet expectations. Expectations are an important thing. Knowing what we expect, knowing, having those expectations met, expectations are important. And verse 1 tells us something significant. It says that on the, the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb and they were bringing the spices that they had prepared. Now, when they came to the tomb, here's the, they weren't expecting a resurrection. There, there's something about their expectations that morning that we get a sense of what, what they were doing as they were coming to the tomb. They were carrying these spices with them. Now, those spices were not for a Teresa Colors cooking class. They, they weren't going there hoping to have, we're going to bring these over and Teresa's going to meet us there. And we're going to set up and we're going to cook some great... They, that's not what they were about. They, the Jews didn't embalm bodies. They still don't to this day. And in those times especially, they would, they would wrap a dead body in spices. In fact, we're told in John's account that Joseph of Arimathea, that's the tomb, he owned the tomb that Jesus was laid in. Joseph and Nicodemus, they had already wrapped Jesus' body in about 100 pounds worth of spices. That's what they did in those days. They wrapped the body in spices. It was mostly to combat the smell of decay because the bodies weren't embalmed. But here's the thing, they're bringing spices, and it's their own act of devotion. They know that Joseph and Nicodemus have already done that, but out of their love and devotion to Jesus, they're bringing some more, and listen, the reality is they just expected to find Jesus' body there. That's why they're bringing the spices. They had no expectation of a resurrection, no expectation that His body wouldn't be there. In fact, jump on down to verse 4. It says, they were perplexed about this. They walk into the tomb, they look around, they see the grave clothes laying there, but they don't see the body of Jesus, and they're perplexed. That's the word that Luke uses. And that word means they're at a complete loss. They have no explanation as to, as to why that body is not there. They're completely at a loss as to what is taking place. And it wasn't just the ladies. I mean, there's a sense that we could say, well, well there's just, you know, yeah, these ladies follow Jesus around. But, you know, he had his inner circle. Peter, James, and John, he shared with them. He took them up on the Mount of Transfiguration. He shared with them things that maybe these ladies just didn't know. Maybe they weren't as deep a theologians as the rest of the disciples. It wasn't just the ladies, though. If we jump down to verse 11, they came back, they told all of the apostles what had happened, 
And it says there in verse 11, they would not believe them. Now, that's a significant choice of words. It's one thing to say they did not believe them. That's the ladies come, they tell, us this, they tell them this incredible story. This angel spoke to us, the body wasn't there, the stone was rolled away, and they come and they tell this incredible story. The angel said he's risen. And it's one thing to say the disciples didn't believe that. Well, I got to go check that out. Kind of a Thomas response, right? I got to go see that for myself. I got to go see it with my own two eyes. It's one thing to say they didn't believe. It's entirely different to say they wouldn't believe. Well, that tells us the ladies were trying to convince them. They were trying to make an argument to get these guys to see it, and they absolutely would not believe. None of them were expecting a resurrection that morning. This was a tough weekend on them. You can imagine. This whole weekend has, has had a significant impact on every one of them. It's left them disoriented. It, it's left them disappointed as to what they thought was going to take place. They had an idea of, of what the Messiahship of Jesus was going to look like, what His work here on earth was going to look like, how it was going to culminate, how it was going to play out. And listen, you and I do the same thing sometimes, don't we? We have an idea of what God's work's going to look like in our lives, and sometimes what He does doesn't match what we think, what we expect from Him to do, and our expectations go unmet. We find ourselves maybe in the same place, a little disoriented, a little bit disappointed. I thought God was going to do this. That's not at all what He did. And they had some ideas about what the Messiahship of Jesus was going to look like and how that was going to play out. And they were dis disoriented and disappointed. Mark chapter 16, Mark's account of this tells us that as the ladies were walking to the tomb, they were having this discussion with each other. In Mark 16, verse 3, they say to each other, who will roll the stone away? And it comes across as almost like this casual comment. Like they're, they're walking to the tomb, like this thought had never occurred to them before. We're going to get to the, to the tomb. And there was that large stone. They were seated right there when all that happened, when the body was put into the tomb and when the, the stone was rolled across. They knew where it was. They knew what it looked like. And as they're walking to the tomb, just a couple of days later, they seem to have forgotten all of it. They're completely disoriented. They have this, who's going to roll the stone away? Now, according to, to Josh McDowell's book, Evidence for the Resurrection, he estimates that that stone would have been somewhere between one and a half and two tons, three to 4,000 pounds. And I think it's, it's interesting, it gets a little bit into their frame of mind. They had not even considered how that stone was going to move, this 4,000 pound stone. It would take probably 15 or 20 men, every one of the disciples and then some, to roll this thing away very casually as they walk to the tomb. They say, how are we going to roll that stone away? They're a little disoriented. And they're, and they're disappointed. Down in, a little bit further in, in Luke's gospel, verse 21, we're told, we're told about these two guys on the road to Emmaus. This is after the resurrection, before Jesus has appeared to them. They're, they're talking to the resurrected Jesus. They just don't realize it yet. And this is, this is the conversation that they have, verse 21. They say, we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. But it's been, now it's been the third day. They had an idea of what his, what his ministry was going to look like, what he was going to do. They're deeply disappointed because it didn't fulfill the expectations that they had. What they expected was deliverance from Rome. What he provided for them, they didn't realize this yet, but what he provided for them far exceeded their expectations. They had earthly ideas about what Jesus was going to do. He didn't deliver them from Rome. He delivered them from sin and death. Far greater enemies than Rome ever would have been. A far greater oppressor than the government of Rome ever could have dreamed to be. And his ministry far exceeded his resurrection, the work that he did far exceeded their expectations for what his ministry was going to look like. And that's an important takeaway for us. I think it's important for us when we look at this account, it's important for us to take that away from this, that, that when God is in it, his work should exceed our expectations, shouldn't it? I mean, when he's at work, when he does something, shouldn't it be greater than anything you or I could come up with? Shouldn't it be far beyond anything that we could imagine, anything we could dream of? Shouldn't God work that way? Should that surprise us that that happens? It does, right? It very often does. 
when God exceeds our expectations, we're, we're just completely caught off guard at times. But when He's involved, it should exceed our expectations. Paul said this in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. He said, Now unto him who is able to do infinitely more than all we ask or imagine. I want you to think for just a minute about a situation you're praying about. What is something in your life right now that you're lifting up on a regular basis before the Lord? What is something you're praying about right now? Now consider this. If you had unlimited knowledge about what was going to happen, if you had unlimited power, if you had unlimited resources at your disposal, what would the solution be that you would come up with to that issue? What would you imagine could happen if you had all of that at your disposal? You know, you and I don't. We don't have that at our disposal. But our dad does. Our dad does. He has all of that. And he can work in our lives in a way that infinitely exceeds anything. That thing that you just imagined, that solution, he can work in your life in a way that infinitely exceeds anything you or I ever would have come up with. See, it shouldn't surprise us. that Because when God is at work in something, His work should exceed our expectations. It absolutely will. That great 19th century British preacher, Charles Spurgeon, sometimes called the, the Prince of Preachers, Spurgeon preached a sermon one time called Limiting God. And this is what he said in that message. He said, sometimes blessings come in another shape from what we expected. That's true, right? Sometimes the blessing here came in a shape very different from what they expected. Sometimes blessings come in a shape very different from what we expected. And when that happens, we go again to our knees and we complain to God that He hasn't answered us. We prayed to Him that He would give us silver and He's given us gold instead. But we blind creatures can't understand the value of this new-shaped blessing, and so we go on grumbling to Him as if He never heard us at all. Isn't that the way we react many times? And when, when the work of God is active in our lives, when He's moving in our lives, one of the takeaways we get from the resurrection, from this incredible miracle, is that His work will almost always exceed our expectations. The second thing we learn from this, though, is His work secures our victory. There was victory that was had here. Now, they didn't recognize it. They didn't see it. They didn't understand it. But there was a, a victory that was at work here. A victory that was far greater than anything they ever would have imagined, anything they ever would have dreamed of. Now, I've already used two D words to describe the disciples that day. They were disoriented and they were disappointed. And let me use a third D word to describe them. They were defeated. They were absolutely defeated. John's account of this. John tells us that the angel had a conversation with Mary Magdalene, John chapter 20, verse 13. And this is what she said. They've taken my Lord away. and I don't know where they've laid him. I don't know if she actually said it that way, that kind of whiny voice. I don't know if she said it like that, but that's the way it sounds in my head when I read it. They've taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they laid him. You can hear the defeat in her voice. It's all over. He's, he's not risen from the dead. Somebody's taken his body. That's the only conclusion that makes any sense to her. This whole thing is over. And let's add insult to injury. They've taken his body away. They're absolutely defeated. And the angel here in Luke's account, in verse 5, he asks them a question that's designed to, to snap them out of it, to kind of grab them from the collar a little bit and shake them out of this defeated attitude. He says to them in verse 5, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? What are you doing here in this tomb, in this graveyard, looking for Jesus? What are you doing here? And it's designed to snap them out of this attitude of defeat, to, to get their attention, to bring them back to reality. And he calls him the living one. Last week, we looked at that miracle where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, and Jesus called himself, now you remember what he called himself in that miracle? The resurrection and the life. That's the one he's referring to. The one that Paul refers to in Romans 6, 9, the one that, whom death could not hold. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he said, he gave us a victory. He's conquered sin and death. That's the one. What are you doing looking for him here among dead people in the, in the tombs? You're not going to find him here. 
And when they showed up there, when they showed up there in the graveyard that, that early that Sunday morning, what they expected was defeat. We hear that, hear that in, in Mary's response. They expected defeat. They were faced with victory. They were staring at victory. The empty tomb was not defeat. They've taken my Lord away, and I don't know what they've done with him. His dead body is still somewhere yet undiscovered. They were staring at the evidence of victory. Not at all what they expected. They expected to be defeated. That's how they reacted, but they were staring at victory. And the angel's not being insensitive, asking them, what are you doing looking for Jesus here? He's not being insensitive when he asks that question. They should have known. He says in verses 6 and 7, do you remember? Verse 6, he said, do you remember what he spoke to you when, you were, when he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, crucified and risen on the third day? He's not being insensitive. Listen, this was the only miracle that Jesus told them about in advance. Now, if we've looked at nine of his miracles so far in addition to this one. This is the only one he told them about in advance. Those words that the angel repeats back to them, that's verbatim something Jesus had recorded back in Luke chapter 18. A couple of months before this event, maybe, verbatim Jesus' words to them. He didn't, now, he didn't with the other miracles. When, when he walked on the water... Before that event, he didn't say to the disciples, all right, listen, boys, here's what's going to happen. In a couple weeks, I'm going to send you out into the Sea of Galilee. I'm not going to lie, it's going to get rough. Weather's going to, yeah, the storms are on the Sea of Galilee. It's going to get ugly that night, and you're going to be out there, and it's going to seem like the boat's going down, but don't worry, I'm going to meet you in the center of the lake. He didn't say that. He didn't announce to them it was going to happen, but this one he does. He tells them it's coming. He couldn't have been any clearer, couldn't have been any plainer about what was going to happen. Now, I can't imagine the trauma that they went through, the, the sheer trauma, the absolute horror of watching all of this play out before their eyes. I simply can't imagine that. The horror of watching someone being beaten so much by these Roman soldiers, literally within an inch of his life. I can't imagine that. And then watching that poor man struggle up the side of Calvary's hill, trying to manage that, that heavy cross. I can't imagine. And the, the horrible screams of the nails being driven into his hands and his feet. And that's just absolutely horrifying sound of, of bones coming out of joint as that cross is dropped into that socket on the ground. And watching him struggle on ag in agony on the cross and cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as he dies to see that spear jammed up in his side. For, and even for somebody you didn't know, I can't imagine the sheer horror of watching a total stranger go through all of that. But this wasn't a stranger to them. Someone they loved deeply, who loved them deeply, and I just can't imagine the trauma or the horror they went through that weekend. But at the same time, I think there had to come a point in time when one of them, I don't know how many were there, we move over into Acts chapter 1, right, right after Jesus ascends back into heaven, and we're told there just before the day of Pentecost, a month and a half or so after this event, there are 120 disciples packed into that upper room. I don't know how many were there during this event, how many were there on Calvary watching his crucifixion. But at some point in time during that weekend, I kind of feel like somebody, this, this memory should have popped in somebody and said, hey, we're, wait a minute, you remember? He told us all this was going to happen. You remember he told us he was going to be mocked. He told us he was going to be beaten. He told us he was going to be crucified. And then you remember, he told us something else. I feel like somebody should have remembered that in that group. His enemies remembered. Oh, his enemies knew very well what had happened. Over in Matthew's account, Matthew chapter 27, you remember you're familiar with the count. There, there were Roman guards at the tomb. And do you remember how the Roman guards, or why they were there at the tomb? The chief priests and the Pharisees, they had gone to, Pont to Pontius Pilate, the governor. And this is what they said in Matthew chapter 27. They said, that deceiver, that's what they called Jesus, said he would rise on the third day. His enemies remembered his words. His enemies remembered what he had said. His own disciples did not. And see, that's why they were defeated. That's why they were all living in defeat in some, in some form or fashion. But that's why the disciples were, had such a defeated attitude. His enemies were defeated because they knew his word, but they didn't believe him. 
His own disciples were living in defeat because they believed him, absolutely. That bold proclamation from Peter, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. They believed him. Martha's proclamation last week in that miracle we looked at, raising Lazarus from the dead. You are the Son of God who has come into the world. His own disciples believed him. The problem is they didn't know his word. For completely different reasons, they were living in defeat. His enemies, they, they knew his word, they just didn't believe him. His, his own disciples believed him but didn't know his word. But then look at verse number 8. Then they remembered. Then they remembered his word. That changed everything. That radically altered this. It changed absolutely everything. Because his word applied to our lives changes everything. It's not just knowing it, but living it out. Believing it to the point that it affects our lives. That changes everything. I'm reading through the Psalms in my quiet time right now. And if you've never read through the Psalms, let me encourage you to do that. The Psalms cover everything, every aspect of life, every, all the range of emotions, everything. You'll find it all in the Psalms. I encourage you to read through the Psalms, 150 Psalms. And probably 65 of them or so would be categorized as what we would call lament Psalms. It's a time of lament. David, or most, the Psalm most of them written by David, but the psalmist is talking about the sorrow in their lives, talking about the difficulty that they're going through, lamenting to God about what is happening. Now, let me, let me paraphrase the lament psalms for you. This, this is how you could paraphrase every one of them, I think. God, my life really stinks right now, yet I will trust you. Every single lament psalm that I have come across so far, and I've read through them several times, just reminding myself of what they all say, but they all have that same general structure. God, my life really stinks right now, yet I will trust you. And as, as I read through them, I, I wrote this question in my journal as I was reading several of them. I wrote this down. How did the psalmist get to that place? See, I want to get to that place. I'll admit I'm not there yet. Oftentimes when, when I come to a place and say, my life really stinks now, God, I want to swim a little bit in the pool of pity. I don't, I'm, I don't immediately jump to the place and say, yet I will trust you. I want to get there. And so I wrote that question down in my journal. How did the psalmist get to that place? And almost immediately as I finished writing that question, it was like the Spirit of God spoke to my heart. And this is what I wrote almost immediately next, by building his faith on the truth of God's Word. He didn't build on the things people told him. He didn't build on the things that he heard around on the street. He built on the truth of God's Word. That's why he could instantly jump from that place to say, Lord, my life stinks right now, and yet I will trust you. He built his faith on the truth of God's Word. Paul said in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And that's not just to get us saved. If you want to come to salvation, know that you will spend eternity in heaven with God. You have to come on His terms. Faith by what His word says, who we are. Sinners in His sight, incapable of doing anything to change that. Only hope is a faith in Jesus Christ. That's what His word says. You want to come to faith in Christ and know like you know like you know that you're saved. You've got to come on His terms. Yes, it applies in that. But remember, when Paul wrote Romans, he wasn't writing to unbelievers. He was writing to the church. Believers already. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And when we feed on the Word of God, we feed our faith. That's what makes it strong. When we don't, we starve our faith. That's what makes it weak. Listen, they were defeated. They were standing there looking at the evidence of victory. And why didn't they know it? Why were they so defeated? Because there with the evidence of victory in front of them, they forgot the word of God. They didn't apply the word of God to their lives. Let me encourage you to make it a habit to be on your own in the word of God on a regular basis. And if you need help to get started, I don't know where to start. This is a big book, Pastor. Where am I going to get started? If you need help to get started, you need someone to just tell you, how do I get this thing going? What should I do? You need help doing that? Come talk to me. I'll be glad to help you get started with that. Let me encourage you to have a steady diet of God's Word in your life. Get plugged into one of the Bible studies, plugged into one of the home groups. You can have time to discuss, hey, I read this. I don't really understand it. You can have that time to discuss and be encouraged. Don't live in defeat because you don't know His Word. That's where they were. 
things we learn from the resurrection, that His work will exceed our expectations. His work secures our victory. And the last thing is it compels us to go and tell. His work compels us to go and tell. Verse number 9. And they returned from the tomb, and they reported all these things to the eleven and all the rest. They were Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and also the other women with them, telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared as nonsense to them, and they simply would not believe them. Now be honest, we're in church, so you've got to be honest this morning. When I, when I mention to you that His work compels us to go and tell, and you hear that, that, that we are compelled to go and tell the world, isn't there something inside that's kind of a little like a teenager, right? I know, Dad, come on, I, okay, I heard, roll, geez, don't you tell me again, right? Isn't there something inside that kind of reacts that way? Yeah, I've heard that before. And we look at, we look at sharing the gospel and going, spreading this message. We look at it as, a, as an obligation, and it is. We ought to look at it that way. Matthew's account, Matthew chapter 28, he, he writes about the same account. Verse 7 of Matthew 28, the angel tells the ladies, go and tell the others. It's a command. It's not a suggestion. He didn't say, if you feel like it, go on out and tell the others. When the mood hits you, when the mood strikes you, go on out. He says, go, do it right now. Tell them. It is an obligation. But it's not just that. It's an obligation, but it's also a privilege. The opportunity for us to share the gospel is not just an obligation. It's a privilege. I've said this about a hundred times before, and I'll say it a million times again before, before I pass away out of this life, that God doesn't need us. He doesn't need us to be involved in this. He doesn't need us to be involved in His work. He doesn't need us to share the gospel. And we're not doing God any favors when we share the gospel, when we go out and share His truth. We're not doing Him a favor. We're not doing the church any favors when we go out and share His gospel. If anything, He's doing us a favor by including us in that. Listen, He created mankind by taking a pile of dirt and breathing on it. That's how He created us. That's, that's the God we're dealing with. He can make the rocks cry out if we won't praise Him. That's the God we're dealing with. He does not need you or I are involved. It's an incredible privilege that He allows us to be involved. Yes, it's an obligation, but it's also a privilege. Matthew's account, verse 7 of, tw- of verse 20, or chapter 28, the angel says, go and tell. Verse 8, it says, they went with great joy. Listen, they had just learned the greatest news they were ever going to know. No wonder they went with great joy. And you and I, we have our sins forgiven and we come to Christ. We have experienced the greatest thing we will ever experience in our lives. No wonder we would want to go and tell. With great joy to go and tell. To consider it an incredible privilege to be able to tell someone else about this. Now, they weren't met with great joy. They got back, they told those people that they really were, I think, expecting that the disciples would be all excited to hear this news. They weren't met with great joy. The disciples thought they were babbling. This is nonsense. They simply wouldn't believe it. But listen, the disbelief of others shouldn't discourage us from telling. Shouldn't discourage us, shouldn't keep us from telling others, well, they may not believe me. They might not accept it. They might think my words are nonsense. They simply might not believe it. It shouldn't discourage us from telling Paul told Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, he said, preach the word in season and out of season. Listen, in season and out of season doesn't mean whether you feel like it or not. That's kind of how we, I think when we hear it, that's what we instantly think. That's not what it means. One commentator said this, it means whether the opportunity seems ripe or not. That really doesn't have anything to do with how I feel about it. Is, Is the door open? Is the opportunity there? And whether the opportunity seems right or not for us to preach the word in season and out. Let me ask you this. If you were convinced that this building was on fire right now, sitting right here in this room, if you were convinced that the building was on fire, what would your next move be? I mean, there there are probably maybe maybe 50 people or so in this building right now, maybe 35 or 40 in this room. There's some kids maybe upstairs. What would your next move be? There's 50 people in this building. Would you run outside, save yourself, stand out front and think, boy, I hope somebody tells the others. Would that be your next move? I don't think so. And I know, I know most of you. I don't think that would be your move. You would count it as your personal mission to grab every other person in this building to make sure they knew. You've got to get out. There is danger. There is a message you need to know. And maybe they don't believe you. Maybe they think your words are nonsense. 
Maybe you simply can't convince them, but that wouldn't discourage you, would it? You would make sure every single person in this building knew that this building's on fire, we've got to go. And if you and I really believe the Bible's message, if we really believe that mankind are born sinners, you look around, you, you can't deny that that's true. If you really believe that that's true, that if that sin separates us from God, and if we pass on into eternity with that sin unforgiven, we will spend eternity separated from Him in a place the Bible calls hell. And the only way to do anything about that is not, not by more religion, not by going to church more, not by doing more, but simply only by faith and trust in Jesus Christ. If we really believe that that message is true, it should compel us. We can't stand outside like we would at the building. We can't stand outside and say, I'm saved, I hope somebody tells the others. We simply can. It compels us to tell. Because the gospel is the message of hope that the world is desperate for. They absolutely need to find hope. Look at the way people are looking around the world. They're desperate, grasping at anything for hope. And they're looking for it in activities or success or money or power or drugs or alcohol, whatever. They're grasping for hope. And it's always outside their reach. The, the gospel is the message of hope they're desperate for. Now, how are we going to do that? How are we going to take this message of hope to the world? We don't have all the answers yet. We don't have all the answers of how we're going to do that. But I think we do have a good start. That's why we talked earlier about starting this Sechile home group. That's why we have any home group Bible studies. It's a good opportunity for you to get together and grow in your faith. It's a great opportunity for you to grab your neighbors and say, come three doors down. Let's get together. Let's talk about the Word of God. That's one of the ways we're thinking of doing it. Trying to be involved in this Wyvern Wonderland. Our missions committee has some goals for this coming year to have some more outreaches on base, some more home front deployment dinners, outreach to the dorms, outreach to English-speaking non-Americans. Listen, we don't know how we're going to do any of that stuff yet. We don't have the answers on any of that stuff yet. But to borrow the phrase from the Marines, we're looking for a few good men, a few good women, a few good folks that are compelled to go to say this message is far greater than a burning building. And I'm compelled to go. We're looking for a few people to roll up their sleeves and say, I don't have any all the answers either, but I'm willing to get involved and willing to join. So the miracles of Jesus are, are far more than just what meets the eye. And we look at those events, those things that happened, and what took place in those moments is far greater than just what meets the eye. They all have a powerful lesson about who Jesus is, a powerful takeaway for us to say, this is, this is something significant about my Lord that I learned from this. And the resurrection is the most powerful of them. And we learn about His work, how He is at work in our lives, that it always exceeds our expectations. It secures our victory. He brings life and compels us to go and tell others about it. In a few moments, we're going to sing our closing worship song. And I just want you to consider this over the next few moments. I don't know where you are in your relationship with Christ. Maybe you're here this morning and you've been thinking all along that I, if, I just, if I just collect enough religion in my life, that'll get me into heaven. That'll impress God enough. I just do enough good things. And maybe that's where you are. Maybe you're here this morning and, and you had never even considered the fact that, you know what, I can pile up religion all day long and that'll never be enough to get God to forget I'm a sinner. That'll never be enough to secure my forgiveness. But I know there's never been a point in my life when I repented of sins and trusted in Christ. Maybe that's where you are this morning. Maybe you're here, you're a believer, and you say, you know what, I, I've not been compelled to go. I've, I've looked at the work of God, and, I, and I've expected far too less of Him. And I'm often surprised when His work exceeds my expectations. Maybe that's where you are. And I don't know where you are in your relationship with Christ this morning. As we sing this final worship song, I'm going to ask the praise team to come on back up. As we sing this final worship song, just consider how the Spirit of God has spoken to you today, how He's, how he's impacted your heart this morning, the decision that He wants you to make in response. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Father, thank You for Your love, for Your grace, for Your power in our lives that can accomplish far more, infinitely more than we would ever hope or imagine starting with the forgiveness of our sins. What an incredible miracle that is. And Father, I pray as we sing this final worship song, 
as your spirit continues to, to impact our hearts, as we think about the words of this song that we're singing, you combine that with your words spoken this morning. And those decisions that need to be made, Lord, would you give us the boldness, the courage to step out and respond however you are leading us this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll stand with us as we sing our final worship song. Became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross love so amazing love so amazing jesus messiah name above all Blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. His body the bread, His blood the wine, broken and poured out all for love. The whole earth trembled and the veil was torn. Love so amazing, love so amazing. Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. All our hope is in you, all our hope is in you, all the glory. Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven. Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. And if you want to talk to someone after the service about how to make Jesus your Lord, I'll be glad to talk with you about that, pray with you about that. Or maybe there's some issue in your life where you have underestimated God. Or you've not been living in His victory. You've not been compelled to go. And you just want someone to pray with you and encourage you. I'll be glad to do that as well. I'll be right here after the service and hang out for a few minutes if you need someone to talk with or to pray with. Don't forget, as we, as we head out this morning, grab an invitation or two or ten for the Christmas Eve service. Take them with you. Invite your friends and your neighbors to our Christmas Eve service. And don't forget also, this is the last week for Moldova closed donations. Let me pray us out of here. Father, thank you once again for the time we've had together just for the opportunity to open your word and to be challenged by it. And Father, we pray even as we go out of here, 
Father, help us to live in the victory you've already provided for us, just to see it, to know it as we feast on your word. And Father, help us to, to, to be compelled to tell others, to share this message, that they might come to experience this hope that they are so desperate for. Thank you for this time together this morning. Thank you for your resurrection that provides all of that and so much more to our lives. And Father, as we go out from this place, Lord, we pray that you, you would just bless us as we go. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Giver of every breath I breathe, Father of all eternity, Giver of every perfect thing, to you be the glory. Maker of heaven and of earth, no one can comprehend your worth. King over all the universe, to you be the glory. I'm alive because I'm alive in you. And it's all because of Jesus I am alive.